streams with you guys. Um, so for BTC, we are seeing the snowball of weakness come into fruition. Now we've been discussing the snowball probably since down here, right? And every single time that it starts to come into fruition, we always mention it and we call it for what it is. We call it a snowball. We said, um, you know, I I'm not here to bullshit you. Oh, I didn't actually say that at this time. Again, all the receipts are there. You get to see exactly what we said, how we ebbed and how we flowed, everything that we said, what our assumptions were, right? I'm not going to try and bullshit you. So when we saw this snowball of weakness here, we said, oh, that's not good, right? That kind of aligns with our high time frame top signature. That's that weakness. We swept the high. We deviated back inside of the range. That implies mid range and then range lows. Well, we got mid range. Our two hour, 200 moving averages were the high time frame trend portrayal at that time. We tested those and we continued higher. So we negated that snowball of weakness. Great. We love to see it. That means that we get to go back into the mindset of which we had for a month prior to that, which was up into the top right corner, level to level, just target the next level. Don't overcomplicate it. Let's make a lot of money, hopefully. Right. And then that's exactly what happened. Level to level. Great. We test that next level. We then, you know, lose local trends. We reclaim them. We lose them again. We're like, okay, wait, hold on. We're probably in a range, right? We're probably going sideways. Let's assume that we're going sideways. We even chop up two hour 200s. We stop respecting two hour 200s. We then have to go down the line and say, okay, what's the next best trend portrayal? So on and so forth, right? But the whole time we're acknowledging that sideways, that, that range. Uh, I'm going to help. Hold on. Voice chat in Discord. <clears throat> um, the whole time we're acknowledging the range, right? We're acknowledging, hey, the, the higher time frame context is we're going sideways. And then we see the same exact signature again. This time, I believe I was still on vacation. So he said, hey, if it looks like a breakout, sm smells like a breakout, trades like a breakout, it's probably a breakout. Let's call it for what it is. And then it wasn't. It was actually a deviation. We fell back inside of the range and then we go, oh, that's not good, right? We don't like that. Uh, that's another snowball of weakness, right? That's the first sign of weakness. That's our, uh, hey, here's the kind of light bulb that goes off to the major top signature that we've seen every single time for the past two years. We've seen the same thing over and over and over again. BTC consolidates, you know, in a sideways range, relatively equal highs two or three times. And then we sweep those highs and then we fall back inside of the, the range. And then suddenly uh, we got to help Socrates out. Hold on. Uh, help each other out, right? Um, and then suddenly we are, you know, starting to ramp up that snowball of weakness, right? We go, oh, shit, that's not good. We don't like that. What if we go on to lose four hour 200s from here? What if we break down below the range entirely? That would be very significant because then we're totally aligned with the exact same signature that we've seen at every single high time frame top every single time for the past two years. That's not good. We don't like that, right? So we called it for what it was. We're just ebbing and flowing. We said, hey, if that's weakness, we have to acknowledge that it is weakness. And granted, the actual move itself played out so quick that by the time that I was even able to give you an analysis coming back from my vacation, we had already tested the range lows. But the analysis would have been, oh, deviation, just like every single other time, deviation probably implies uh, range resumption right? Whatever the normal is in ranges and the normal in ranges is range highs, mid range, range lows, range lows, mid range, range highs, range highs, mid range, range lows, range lows, mid range, range highs, range highs, mid range, range lows, right? So it's nothing new. So that falling back inside of the range is that snowball of weakness that allows us to think, oh shit, maybe we might compound into a greater bearish argument here, right? Um, whoever does not have their mic muted, please mute it for me. Um, man, you guys are all over the place right now. I <laughs> can't keep getting caught off guard. These streams already drag on long enough, guys. Um, but falling back inside of the range, right? That's that snowball of weakness. And then losing that high time frame trend portrayal, which I didn't know at, at the time, but it was four hour 200s. We said six hour, right? Because that's the trend portrayal that we've been using. That's the trend portrayal that I'm still going to use for a higher time frame outlook. Six hour, 200 moving averages. If we lose that trend, we lose the range lows, then suddenly we are now showing the exact same top signature that we have shown every single other time for the past two years. We can go back and look at those as well, right? 
Instead, we tested support, we tested range lows, range lows went from mid range to range highs, there's no surprise there, we break out of the range all over again, we call the breakout for what it is, if it looks like a breakout trades like a breakout smells like a breakout, it's probably a breakout. So we call it for what it is. We even pulled back and retested this region as support, we said, Hey, we're still bullish, right? I know people are freaking out because we uh, hope the, the fake ETF spot approval news made a negative three uh, percent candlestick sold the news blah, blah 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 yeah no it was still a bullish retest we call it for, called it for what it was at the exact retest so that's not hindsight analysis we said hey that's support right if instead we deviate back inside of the range that's not good but as of right now it's still a bullish retest we still threaten higher highs we still threaten a push from level to level just as we have every single time for the past three months we can assume 45k into 50 right and if we don't get there, so be it. We would have to see weakness on the way, um, you know, to not getting to 50K. We start to break down below local trends and so on and so forth. Well, so far, so good. That's exactly what we did. We tested that region. We then put in that higher high. We tried to continue. We tried to embark on our journey into 50K, test that next major supply zone per Mercury's, you know, arbitrary gray boxes and all those drawings and whatnot. And instead, we only got to 49K. Boo hoo. Whoa, you, your life sucks. Uh, you, you thought we would go to 50. We only went to 49. Cry about it, right? And then from there, we started to break down. We can probably see the breakdown in the form of a local uh, trend loss. And then from there, we lose the range highs. So now we're deviating back inside of the range. And then from there, we are threatening breaking down below 4-hour 200s, currently being tested as we speak. If we break down below four hour 200s, that allows room for our six hour 200s to be tested. If we lose six hour 200s, the probability of us breaking down below the range entirely significantly increases because now there has not been a time within the range that we've been trading below the six hour 200s, below the exact same trend portrayal that we've been assessing since back here, right? Which acted perfectly as support on that most recent test. And uh, if we lose it today, we would assume our perception of probabilities gets increased towards bearish arguments because that snowball has now compounded onto itself. Suddenly, it's no longer just a loss of uh, the range high, a deviation back inside of the range as it was snowball, snowball. Suddenly, it is snowball we lose four hour 200s, that's a greater snowball. We lose six hour 200s, that's the body of a snowman. We lose the range lows, that is a full fledged snowman. Essentially, it's only missing the top hat, the, the carrot for a nose, the sticks for arms, whatever, because at that point, we would be bearish on every single time frame, except for this one, right? So what does that mean? If we're bearish on every single time frame at this point from 40k onwards, and the only time frame that you can say bullish arguments for, hey, it's still a dip, I'm still buying a dip, I'm just buying a deeper pullback, right? I'm not, I'm not catching knives, I'm not counter trading trends, I'm buying a dip. What time frame can you say that on? Only the daily. Only the daily would be applicable because only that time frame could you ask a four-year-old and they would still tell you at that point, we're still heading to the top right corner. And the weekly as well, but that even gets less actionable, right? So we don't really care about that. So here's why I say it's basically a full-fledged snowman. It's just missing the top hat, the carrot for a nose, the six for arms, whatever, right? Because at that point, we are downtrending on the five minute, downtrending on the hourly. We've fallen through a two month long range. We've now lost a three or, or four month long trend portrayal, right? At that point, we are downtrending. If you go ask a four year old, hey, on the four hour chart, what are we doing? On the hourly, what are we doing? On the, right? On any of those time frames, they're going to tell you downtrend. We're going to the bottom right corner, right? So if I'm saying, hey, we're bearish on all time frames, but we're still bullish on the daily one. Don't worry, guys. We're still bullish. We're still buying pullbacks. Don't worry about it. 200 daily moving averages still portray the idea that we're headed to the top right corner regardless. And we're still in a bullish environment. So don't worry. Just, just totally neglect all of the bearish arguments. Just totally write off the exact same top signature that we've seen. We've watched as we deviated back inside of the range, lost four hour 200s, then lost six hour 200s, then lost the range lows. Yeah, just, just forget about all that because we're still bullish on the daily, right? 200 daily moving averages, don't worry about it. What I just told you is, hey, 
don't care about the next negative 26% of price action because maybe we find a higher low to this kind of structure, right? Maybe we find a higher low here and then maybe we can continue higher in the next, I don't know, six months or whatever the fuck. Is that a good analysis? No. Is that something that you can go and execute off of today? No. You can't execute off of it. So it's not actionable, right? But it's the proper analysis. I didn't lie to you. 200 dailies probably are a very significant support level. You probably do want to take, take them into account. We probably don't want to just write off the idea of a full-fledged bull market until those 200 dailies are lost. So that means that we're allowed to still be bullish as long as we're above the 200 dailies, right? Here's the thing. Why does it have to be, you are either bullish, you're either assuming that we go to new all-time highs, $100,000, $500,000, bull market, uh, Justin Bieber is going to flex his board ape again, or capital is right, we're going to zero, 12K incoming. Why does it have to be one or the other? Why can't we just, hey, this time frame's bearish, we're, we're trading sideways on this one, this one's bearish, this one's still bullish, that one's still bullish, that one's still bullish. Why can't we have that? Oh, because it's much easier to just think in extremes, right? We're either going to 100K or we're going to 10K. There is no in between. That's pathetic. That's not reality. 90% of the time that you trade markets, we are not in a bull market. We're not in a bear market. It's just the market. It's just the gray zone. You have to be able to navigate things. You have to be able to attribute context. You have to be able to understand higher time frames. You have to be able to understand how things start to progress, how the snowball forms, how we can piece the puzzle together to have a pretty clear understanding of what that puzzle might look like when it's fully pieced together, right? That needs to be our form of comprehension. So we need to be able to, at the same time, acknowledge arguments in our present day, but also relate them to the bigger picture. So if something is negative 25% before it might happen, that's not really an actionable analysis, even if it's a valid analysis. Remember, there were people telling me that I was a complete fucking fool for flipping bearish here because we lost 200, uh, four hour 200 moving averages. We broke our daily market structure in the form of a lower low and we lost a key demand zone. That's all three parts of my system, correct? Mercury just uses moving averages, gray boxes as support and resistance, and then market structure interpretation. That's it. So all three parts of my system flip bearish here. People are telling me, hey, you're a complete idiot for flipping bearish on the chart because we're in a bull market and uh, we're still above 200 daily moving averages. We're still holding a higher low on the weekly market structure, right? So essentially what they told me is you're a complete fucking idiot for flipping bearish here because we can go to 42K and still be bullish. And you know what? They're right. That is a proper analysis. You go try and trade that though. Tell me how that works out for you. That's the point. We remain actionable. We adapt and remain uh, fluid like water, right? Bruce Lee said to be like water, not underwater. That's, I don't think people comprehended that, right? That's the point. We want to adapt to whatever the chart is doing. We don't allow ourselves to get lulled into a complacency kind of state of mind because the market has managed to do one thing for X amount of time and Y amount of percentage. And now it's not doing that same thing, but we got used to it doing whatever it was doing for the past three months and 80% and of rally. No, that's just normal markets right? I mean, that's just kind of normal in day-to-day in -day markets. Markets do something for a certain amount of time over a certain amount of percentage, and then they do the exact opposite. And it's not just up or down. It's not just, uh, oh my God, we went into a bull market and now we're in a bear market. It's not that. It's also, hey, we were ranging for two months and now we're trending again. Hey, we were incredibly volatile for the past week, but now we're just going to kind of, you know, go flat and maybe at best you might get a 2% daily candle amplitude, right? High and lows, maybe 2% kind of range. Hey, we were trading in a 2% range for three months, but now, right, we just got a 15% daily candlestick. Low volatility, high volatility, high volatility, low volatility, up, down, down, up. 
sideways trend, trend sideways. Markets will always do whatever they are going to do for a specific amount of time over a specific amount of percentage, and then they will always do the exact opposite. The only thing that changes is the time and the percentage. Do not allow yourself to be caught off guard by that fact, because it is a fact. That's just how markets work. It will always be the case. It's just either more extreme time with more extreme percentage or less extreme or somewhere in the middle. But you cannot allow yourself to be caught off guard by normal market movements. Number go up sometimes, and then sometimes it goes down, and then sometimes it goes sideways, and then sometimes it starts to go up or down, and then sometimes it's incredibly volatile, and we have crazy candlesticks. Oh my God, this is what the hell? We have a big green fat candlestick, and then we start to go sideways for a little bit. Normal market movements. Normal. Nothing crazy. Just the same shit that we've been dealing with since however long you've joined crypto. Same thing. Same story that, right? So we will continue to adapt. And we are seeing snowballs of weakness form. We are potentially losing four hour 200s as I speak right now, right? That is an additional bearish argument that's being compounded onto the fact that we already fell back inside of the range high. Let's acknowledge it. If we're forced to eat, eat dirt and say, hey, we're back above the range again. We get to assume the same winning mindset that we've won with for the past three months. We get to go back into that mindset. You watched as we did exactly that here. I'm not here to tell you, oh, uh, uh, I didn't call this. A, I, I didn't actually call this a deviation. Uh, I hedged my analysis. I said that maybe it would be a deviation. No, I'm not here to, to bullshit you. In fact, you should be kind of impressed by how we did make the wrong analysis he here and then said, hey, it's supposed to be a breakout, right? And then it was a deviation. And then we said, oh, it's a deviation. Maybe this is going to start, you know, compounding bearish arguments, blah, blah, blah. And instead we adapted and were able to say, oh, breakout, pullback, retest, let's look for higher highs. You should be impressed by how we were wrong and yet we still managed to find a way to turn it around and ebb and flow with whatever the market did to be right. And you could have made money from that analysis. You could have actionably executed off of those thoughts and been rewarded from it. But wait, but we said deviation here. We said, hey, this may be the first sign of a major top signature and maybe BTC is, has you know blown off and maybe blah, 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 and yada, yada. Oh, and we still managed to turn it around and ebb and flow with whatever the market did. That's the point. Not here to go back and, and pretend like you can't go watch recordings or go see what I said on a specific day. No, I actually encourage that. Go, especially go look at the times we were wrong. And then go see exactly how we were able to adapt and find a way to be right along with the market because the market's never wrong, right? That's the point. I don't claim to be right 100% of the time. I claim to be able to adapt to whatever happens 100% of the time. You have to be able to say the same for yourself. We're not here to speculate and throw crystal balls. Right. And just rub our crystal balls and pretend like we know the future. And right, we're going to step into the ring with Muhammad Ali and knock him out. That's just not realistic. It's not going to happen. Right. But what I can do is have a nice way of thinking, a thought process, a, a mindset, and ensure that I will always win over a period of time. <clears throat> Muhammad Ali is human. I don't know what you mean by that stacker. <laughs> so uh, just some warning signs on BTC. Let's let's at least acknowledge those. We don't want to just write it off. The invalidation to that analysis, by the way, is breaking out of the range once again. So if you're sitting here saying Mercury, um, you know, I, I don't agree with you. We're still above four hour 200s. We are, you know, still looks like an uptrend to me. I think this is going to be the higher low. This is a dip for me to go and buy. That's totally fine. I can agree with you once we break out of the range once again, because that invalidates the idea of a deviation because we're no longer doing the normal thing in ranges, which is trading inside of the range, right? 
And at that point, we're trading outside of the range. And then I have to go, oh, based on local you know, trend assumptions and then scaling that up to higher time frames, we're breaking out of the range again. We're probably going to continue uptrending, blah, 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 yada, yada. As long as that never happens, there's no reason for me to uh, deviate away from my analysis. So here's the fun part. Notice everything that I just told you for BTC. It's not even close to what I'm going to tell you for Ethereum. It's not even close. You want to sit here and call, you know, oh, guard dogs barking at the wind and blah, blah, blah. And hey, Ethereum rotation, time to rotate, time to rotate. Ethereum's the laggard. It's the laggard. It's the laggard. It's the laggard. Oh my God, I've heard the same thing over and over and over and over and over again for the same people for a year fucking straight. For a year straight, they have continuously been wrong. For a year straight, Ethereum has continuously underperformed. And now it's not. Hmm. Those guard dogs that have been barking at the wind are, of course, going to have barked prior. But I trained my guard dog to only bark when a real threat shows up. If it ends up being that my guard dog barks and it wasn't actually a real threat, and instead it was just some sketchy ass kid who was walking home from a baseball game late at night, he had a late practice, right, or whatever, and he's holding a baseball bat and he just so happens to be wearing all black, he looks really sketchy. My guard dog barks to let me know that there's a potential threat, but that kid meant no harm. He's just trying to get home. If that's the case, that's totally fine. I'm still going to reward my guard dog. They are supposed to bark when things like that start to happen. If eventually it gets to the point where this kid every single weekend is walking home late at night holding a baseball bat and he's always wearing the same clothes, right? He's dressed in all black and just loves to have his hoodie up. I'm going to train my guard dog to stop barking when they see that kid. I will adjust to that kind of thing happening because I will have gotten used to it not working, right? So I'll train that into my guard dog. But in the meantime, my guard dog is supposed to bark for moments like this, for moments when Ethereum breaks out of a weekly supply zone that it has not traded above since May of 2022. Did you just hear what I said? We have not traded above this region since May of 2022. Oh, but let me let me get out of all my Ethereum positions 5% higher. Because, right? I don't know. It's, we're up 5%. And I've watched for a year straight as people have made the same argument that I'm making today and have been wrong. Maybe I'm going to be wrong too. Is that the way we're supposed to think in markets? Right? Because the guard dog that has been barking at the wind for the past year has always been wrong. There's never actually been a threat. So when our guard dog starts to bark... We're just going to write it off because the other guard dog fucking sucks. So maybe our our good doggy has picked up some bad habits from the other dog. No, that's not really how that works, right? We're going to respect our system. We're going to respect our guard dog. We have to. It's the only thing that's going to keep us level-headed and be able to adapt, be able to adjust and ebb and flow with whatever happens next. I'm not claiming to be right. It absolutely could just be some sketchy-ass kid walking home late, late at night from a baseball game. And that's what Ethereum does, right? We deviate back inside of the range. Oh, shit, that's not good. We lose four hour 200s. Oh, that's an additional bearish argument. We fall below the range low. Oh, probably going to at least retest those 200 dailies down here. We don't even hold the 200 dailies. Oh, shit. Now that's a deviation back inside of this range. Hmm, that's not good. Yes, it absolutely could be that. But if you're going to fear something in markets, please acknowledge that there's always a fear to have. Please acknowledge that. This is how you take comfort in risk. You want to know how you develop some balls to be able to see positions through for very, very high time frame kind of outlooks. You want to know how you do that? You fully take comfort in risk. You take comfort in fear and the fact that if you are going to fear something, there's always a fear to have. And we can relate this back to the real world. And it's pretty corny and, and kiddish and stupid and over-exaggerated, but I absolutely will do it to try and get a point across. If you're going to fear something in markets, there's always a fear to have. 
If you're going to fear buying Ethereum on the breakout of this key weekly zone or buying inside of this range and then hoping for a breakout or whatever it may be, however you decided to approach. Glitch said he bought the full hour 200 maze reclaim intra range and then scaled assumptions into an eventual range high breakout into, right, which is also this weekly supply zone breakout so that he could target level level, which by the way, let's get something clear. We said the exact same thing back here, right? And, and even again, it's not that I'm always right. I will prove to you I'm not. We said the exact same thing back here too. So we said level, level. So we were right. We break out of a key level. We're probably just going to head for the next one. Daily, daily resistance, 1950. Oh, we broke out of that. Okay, cool. Let's target 2,500, right? Or 2,400, sorry. So it worked. So, wow, Mercury's a genius. No, I'm not. I'm just listening to my guard dog. Good doggy, right? We already knew that we were bullish and uptrending on the way up into this level. We knew that here too. Same exact story. But wait, Mercury, you said the exact same thing this time too. You said above 1950 into 2400 and it didn't work. So clearly you're a fucking idiot. So now this time when you say the exact same thing, I'm not going to listen because you suck. That's not how markets work. We don't rely on the ability to be right 100% of the time. We rely on the ability to adapt regardless of whatever happens. If we're not right, if we don't go to 2400, what do we have to do? You got to lose 1950 again. You're also losing a local trend portrayal if you can visualize it and see through all my squiggly lines at the same exact time. You bearish retest that local trend and that resistance in one. You then compound the bearish arguments into a loss of a high time frame trend. You then, right? We adapt. Either what we said would happen happens and we're geniuses and we make lots of money or it doesn't, we're wrong and we're forced to adjust. This is always the case in markets. But again, if you're going to fear something, there's always a fear to have. If you're fearful of buying Ethereum and, and scaling assumptions into the next resistance or trading the trend or whatever it may be, you could not say Ethereum, you could say whatever coin you want to say. If you're fearful of it, what is your fear? You buy and number goes down. Well, what happens when you sell that position? Because you play into your fear, right? That's what we, we tend to do. We play into our fears. We're like, oh, I don't know what it's like to win because I don't allow my ideas to even play through long enough to see if I'm even a winner or not, right? Because I'm constantly playing into my fears. Here's my fear today. Maybe Ethereum goes down because I'm bullish on it, right? And uh, so I'm going to sell. So then you sell and what happens? Oh, shit. Now I'm sidelined. What if I'm right? What if Ethereum does go from 2,500 to 3,400? Do you see what just happened? You were positioned, you had a fear, you played into that fear, now you're positioned a different way, and yet you still have a new fear. So you're like, okay, well, shit, um, I don't know what to do here. No, surely, surely this is not going to work, right? I, I, man, I always think something's going to happen. I'm always wrong. Uh, shit, I hate that this is starting to play out without me. I really fucking hate it. You know what? I know that I was bullish on Ethereum, but this kind of looks like a, a mid-range point. This is probably fair value zone. So when we get to 2,900, I'm going to short. So then you short. And then what happens? Now you're fearful. Oh, shit. Wait. Not only am I going to miss out on the trend, but also I'm going to lose money because my idea is going to play out without me. We are going to go up. So now you're positioned a different way. Now you're net negative on Ethereum. And you still have a fucking fear. It didn't go away. It didn't just vanish just because you're positioned differently. There's always a fear to have. Imagine how ridiculous it would be to have a fear of being in cars, right? You hate cars. And quite frankly, that's valid. And they are big metal vehicles of death, right? You hate cars. You're fearful of them. So you don't go anywhere. You just stay in your home all day. Okay. You've mitigated that fear. Now a new fear approaches. What if somebody does come to rob my house? My guard dog barks, right? But my guard dog is a golden retriever. What are they going to do? Lick his face? 
lick the intruder's face. They're not going to attack the intruder. My guard dog's barking. Someone comes to rob me. They threaten me in my own, my own house. Um, shit. That's scary. So I'm home 24 seven, right? hundred percent of the time because I, I don't go anywhere because I'm afraid of being in a car. Um, so I'm just home all day. So if someone comes to rob my house, that's going to be a, a, a confrontation. 100% of the time. I'm always home. All right, you know what? Uh, to mitigate that fear, I'm just going to lock myself in my basement. I'm just going to go hang out in my basement. I'm never going to leave my basement. You know, I'll have everything, you know, door dashed to me, uh, all my groceries, everything. I'll only come up to grab those. I'll just lock myself away in the basement. What if your basement floods? You're always going to be in the basement. You're going to be flooded along with it. If you're going to fear something, there's always a fear to have. You have to find a way to allow yourself to play into ideas. Whatever your idea is. I'm not saying because we broke out of Mercury's gray box, you have to start targeting Mercury's other gray box. No, I don't give two fucks about the levels. I don't give two shits about what you think on Ethereum or what your levels are, or what system you trade or what moving averages you're using or what trend portrayal you're using. I, I don't care. You have to find a way to have a balanced approach to be able to play into your system, whatever that system is, and take comfort in risk. You have to take comfort in risk. You have to, at the end of the day, be able to stomach the way that you're positioned in the market and say, you know what? It's fine. Because if I'm wrong, here's how much I lose. I'm willing to risk that. That's okay. It's totally fine, right? I know my system wins long term, which again, you cannot know that unless you've been using your system for a long enough period of time. You've proven that to yourself. You developed a resume. You have to be able to put that into practice somehow, some way. You're constantly shooting yourself in the foot, playing into your fears. That's never going to happen. You're just dragging the learning process on and on and on and on further and further and further. It's just going to take you longer and longer and longer before you eventually maybe start to become profitable and everything starts to click. It's not what we want. Put it into practice today. Take comfort and risk. Have ideas and be totally okay with them being wrong. Guys, when, when things start to trend, right? I'm the most arrogant fucking piece of shit on Twitter that you've ever known, right? I just start crazy cringe posting, Pepe memes throwing everywhere, right? Very arrogant, very, you know, at your face kind of uh, analysis on Twitter. It's because men used to go to war and now they're afraid of, of posting their thoughts on the internet. They're afraid of, oh, I might look like an idiot because Bitcoin lover 69420 said that I'm a complete fucking fool because two months ago I said that this would happen and it didn't. If that's the case, you're not going to make it. Oh my God, you're not going to make it. If you're afraid of what other people think of you or how you perceive your analysis is perceived or whatever, how the fuck are you going to have the balls and the courage to even see your own thoughts through? It's not possible. It doesn't work that way. Allow yourself to play into your system. Ethereum is clearly, clearly, if I have taught you anything in your time in being in this discord, one of these charts is stronger than the other. Which one is it? This one, which just recently created a higher high, or the other one, Bitcoin, which is deviated back inside of this range and is threatening creating a lower low and losing a high time frame trend portrayal. Which one is it? The answer is clear. It takes a four-year-old four seconds to be able to tell me which one's stronger than the other. Let's accept it for what it is. And if it's wrong, we adapt. It is what it is. Bruce Lee, right? We get to be like water and not underwater. And if we are underwater for a long enough period of time and a certain amount of you know price, then we cut. That's what stop losses are for. Ethereum is incredibly bullish in my perspective. I've been saying this since we broke out of the range. I will continue to tell you this. I will continue to tell, tell you this even if we pull back deeper into this range high. And hopefully if we live in a world where that is 
rainbows and butterflies and dandelions. We also have four hour 200s as confluence with that region. And that would set the stage for a very nice, clean, actually technically swing long kind of setup so that we could play into the analysis that I just gave you by scaling assumptions from our four hour chart into our daily. Daily says level to level, right? But we can use four hour 200s and four hour market structure to interpret that and scale the assumptions up to the daily chart and also play into the idea that we're going level to level, right? Because this would be a breakout, pullback, retest, and then we would look for continuation. The story is the same as every single price action movement, every single trade idea, every single Friday altcoins watch list, trade, setup, thought, rough draft, whatever, that we have been saying for not only three months, but also for the entire time that you've been here. It's just the same concept. Shut up, Siri. <laughs> Did you guys hear that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know. Siri just decided to, to start talking. <laughs> Um, sorry. I'm a, I'm still a four year old, by the way. Make myself laugh. Uh, okay. So Ethereum BTC, um, we've been looking for snowballs of bullishness, right? Of strength on this so that we could start to say, Hey, this is, you know, a lot different than what we've been seeing. This looks pretty damn good. Maybe things are just starting to get even more absurd. And then similar to everyone's a genius kind of season, right? Well, so far, Ethereum has done that. You can see that I already drew this as a uh, range deviation as it stands. I am very much front running myself here. So this is still a bit more speculative than I like. Here's how I'm able to justify doing that. Whenever Ethereum does deviate back inside of these ranges, it tends to not really give you much of a chance to adapt into that analysis, right? It tends to just kind of move very much vertically. So I'm fearful of the exact same thing happening today. I fear that if I don't make this analysis today and preemptively put myself in a position where I look like a complete fucking fool, maybe tomorrow, that tomorrow comes. And by the time that I make this analysis, it's already halfway played out. That's what my fear is, because that's exactly what happened back here. Right? So Actually, technically, we want to see breakout, pullback, deviation, uh, I'm sorry, deviation back inside of the range, right? Reclaim, 200 daily moving averages shift. Maybe the blue one goes above the green one. That means that momentum starting to shift uh, more exponentially towards the upside, blah, 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 yada, yada. And then we can, you know, hey, that's the breakout, pullback, retest, test the range low, range lows, mid range, range highs. Yay, right? Unfortunately, we don't live in a world that is always rainbows, butterflies, and dandelions. And we might have to speculate and say that this is a breakout prior to it actually technically being a breakout and then hope and pray that, you know, it eventually goes on to be a breakout. And again, is it right? Is it wrong? Should I be calling this a breakout today or should I be waiting for the breakout pullback retest and actually technically textbook kind of price action? Uh, who's to say? Who's to say? Right. We both have the same idea. It's both the exact same concept. We're just approaching it in two different ways. We each have different pros and cons that we have now accepted. So if I call this a breakout today, I might look like a complete fucking fool tomorrow if we're trading down here. Right. Or maybe Monday. Right. Uh, but if we just kind of do this, well, now, good thing I called this a breakout because now I don't have to wait for the breakout pullback retest actually technically, right? So that I can position and start to play into this thesis. Again, not that I'm trading the ETH BTC chart anyways, but just for funsies, let's assume that we do, right? In the meantime, eight hour 200s are what we cared about as a high time frame trend portrayal. And again, kind of same thing. If we delete this purple box for the moment, you can see that the reclaim came in all, all of one candlestick, right? And so did the breakout above the range. And so far, so has the breakout above 200 dailies and deviation back inside the weekly uh, range lows. So it kind of just moved vertically. We just had 
hey, here's all the bearish arguments in the world. And then all in like one day, we negated all of them. Here's a deviation back inside of the range. Here's a reclaim of eight hour 200s and reclaim of mid range as well. Oh, and by the way, we broke out of the range high. Oh, and on top of that, now we're trading above 200 daily moving averages. That all happened in the snap of a finger. Just all in one quick movement. Oh, too bad, so sad. You didn't get to buy the pull breakout pullback retest of the range low so that you could scale assumptions into eight hour 200s, into range highs, and potentially a breakout as well. Yet, sucks to suck. Sorry. We don't live in a world that's rainbows, butterflies, and dandelions. Uh, it is what it is, right? It's opportunity costs. That's the pros and cons that hopefully we accepted prior to any of that even happening in the first place. We've been discussing this, by the way, that the entire appeal to calling uh, bottoms on ETH BTC in this region would be that if it deviated back inside of the range, it probably would do so in very volatile fashion and not really leave a lot of room for people to buy breakout pullbacks, retests of key levels, key trends, etc. prior to fulfilling what the range deviation implies that it'll do. The norm, again. Right. And the norm in range trading is range lows, mid range, range highs, range highs, mid range, range lows, range lows, mid range, range highs. So that's the appeal, right? <clears throat> it's also the appeal because um, when that is the case, when Ethereum BTC, when the king of altcoins starts to drastically outperform Bitcoin, that tends to mean that altcoins are also drastically outperforming Bitcoin which if we look at BTC dominance is being implied here today, uh, at least as of that most recent drop. So we are testing these 200 dailies again. And again, if we lose the 200 dailies because ETH BTC and BTC dominance tend to move inversely, you can see that these charts kind of look similar to each other. They tend to move inversely. If BTC dominance loses 200 dailies, I would imagine that is also ETH BTC reclaiming 200 dailies which would be moving in tandem with the exact same thesis that the altcoin market is really starting to ramp up after a year of underperformance. A year of not really doing too hot against the king, right? That is the general implication. Of course, we know that that's the case on ETH BTC. We also hopefully know that generally speaking, that is the case for uh, altcoins as well. And when I say that, you're like Mercury. What about Solana? What about INJ? What about CAS? What about TIA? What about this coin? What about that coin? What about the few that have managed to outperform that we've been focusing on that we neglected the other 95% of the altcoin market because we've been focusing on the few that have actually managed to go against the grain? You see the point, right? We have now kind of... Um, given ourselves a very short term kind of way of thinking because we're focused on a very small subset that does not agree with the general implication. And we're using that to, to uh, refute the general implication that is true for the other 95% of the market. The other 95% of the market looks like Ethereum BTC. It looks like a downtrend for the entire year. It's not outperforming, it's just higher beta. When when BTC goes up, that coin goes up 10%, right? But when BTC goes down, you know, negative 2%, that, go, that coin retraces that 10% rally and goes down an additional negative five. That's not outperformance. That's just being higher beta. For the majority of the altcoin market, when you go look at them and how they performed against BTC, even if they're up in USD from year to day or whatever, or from 2023 year to day, right? Even if that's the case, they're still not really doing all too well against BTC. They haven't managed to outperform. For the majority of the market, this has been the case. I've been saying for months now, there will be a time, or, or really three months ago, when Solana broke out of you know a 10 month long range, and at $25, I start bull posting Solana and people are like, oh, we had fun. It was a good rally, boys. This is the top for Solana, you know, counter trade Mercury, right? Because he's saying, hey, after a 50% move, Solana just had a 50% move in the past three days. Now Mercury's saying, hey, at $30 Solana, we're probably going to go to 80. Top is in, throw in the towel, hope you had fun. Time to sell your Solana, right? This is not, I didn't make that up. These are real things that people said to me at the time. 
right? Three months ago, and we say, hey, only Solana looks really good. Only Link looks really good. Only INJ looks really good. Only Cast looks really good. Only this coin looks really good. There's only really like four or five coins that look really good. Eventually what happens is the watch list goes from four or five coins and you're only either looking at these four or five coins to suddenly there's like 15, 20 coins and now Mercury has to put out a video because I'm, I hate writing, to be quite honest with you. That's the biggest irony. I hate writing. I really do. I don't enjoy it. Um, I'd mother, much rather make a video. It's easier for me. Take 20 minutes, write a video or, or make a video or take an hour and sit here and, and write up, uh, you know, thoughts on these different altcoins. There's going to come a time where 15, 20 altcoins, you know, that's going to be the Friday altcoins watch list. That's where we're at now today, by the way. Then there's going to come a time where everyone is a fucking genius and you get to come into the Friday altcoins watch list where I get to claim clout. Hey, remember we called this coin? Now it's up 30%, right? Since last Friday, you get to say Mercury. Yeah, but every coin is up 30% since last Friday. Everyone's a genius. You don't get to claim clout on that. It's throw a blind dart. Everyone's a fucking genius. Who, who cares what coin you called or what, what you put in the Friday altcoins watch list? Any coin that you could have picked did the exact same shit. That has not always been the case. When we look for these outperformers, we have managed to find outperformers. We have managed to do that week after week. Week after week, it tends to be that the same outperformers from this week will be the same coins from last week and so on and so forth. We add more coins in or maybe we substitute, okay, this is now broken trend, whereas this coin is starting to show some life. Let's swap the two, right? But eventually there comes a time where everyone's a fucking genius. You get to throw a blind dart at any coin. I would imagine that time is when BTC dominance is downtrending on all time frames, and when ETH BTC is uptrending on all time frames. That tends to be the case. That is what we're starting to see today. This is where we need to think logarithmically. This is where the winners that have won during a BTC led rally now get to try and win during an ETH led one. And you know what's crazy about that? This is exactly how markets have tended to move. Crypto, at least, has tended to move for several years now. This continues to be the case. People continue to overcomplicate it. What tends to be the case is the ETH-led rally is even fucking crazier than the BTC one. It's even fucking crazier. It is, oh my God, wait. People are getting airdropped. NFTs are going up. Wait, every altcoin is starting to show some life to some degree. Oh, shit. Wait a minute. We just had a 80% uh, rally over the course of three months. Now we're assuming that Ethereum might do a 35% rally in the course of two or three weeks. That exponentially kind of more ludicrous. That is typically the case. So when that time comes, only the people who have managed to think logarithmically and applied winning concepts during the past three months get to make the most out of the last 20% of the rally because it tends to be once BTC goes, then Ethereum goes, then altcoins go, and then, yeah, we're kind of frothy and, and that weakness that showed on BTC is now starting to come into fruition. Now we're starting to break down below the range. And remember, the king is the king and we should all respect the king. So whatever BTC is doing, we should probably be uh, follow through. And uh, oh, yeah, by the way, negative 30 percent on your altcoin for the day because of a negative 5 percent BTC candlestick. Yeah, sorry. That's the normal. It tends to be what happens after the, the last 20 percent of the fun which accounts for 80% of the fun because the part that we're entering into potentially and what I'm speaking about is 100% of the reason as to why you're here. When you get to throw random blind darts at any altcoin and you wake up and it's up 20%, and then you wake up the next day and it's up another 30%, and you wake up the next day, it's up another 40 and so on and so forth. And you're like, oh my God, wait, now we're in price discovery. Oh shit, now we're in price discovery. Now I get to target 1.618 fibs. Now, either it gets there or we show weakness and either way I win. So either I get to close out for a minimum 60% gain 
or it goes to 1.618 and I get to go up 150%. Wow. Amazing. Yeah, that. That's why we're here. And that accounts for about 20% of the rally overall. It's the last 20% of the rally. It accounts for about 80% of the fun. The 80-20 rule in marketing, if you know what I'm talking about. So there's a couple other things that I want to discuss. First of all, let's go back over the BTC USDT uh, top signature. Where you said, hey, deviation. Hopefully you guys already know what I'm discussing. Uh, deviation back inside of the range, equal highs, and then fall back through, failure to rally, whatever it may be, and then losses of trends. That's the trigger. That's the nail in the coffin. And then we get to say, oh, that's probably a top, right? But it's not our arbitrary thoughts. It's not that we've managed to find a signature for the past two years, and it tends to be the exact same thing. It's that in agreement with that speculative idea, and hey, I've noticed this for the past two years, and it's starting to happen again. In agreement with that, our system our system, the thing that is tried and true, the thing that keeps us on the right side of the market, the thing that ensures 100% of the time, if we go into a bull market, we will have acknowledged it well before we go into a bull market. If we go into a bear market, we will have acknowledged it well before we go into a bear market. That will also agree because we will have lost key levels. We will have formed bearish arguments. We would have shown weakness on certain timeframes. We would have scaled that weakness to a greater degree. We would have been able to see it in our system. And then we get to relate it back to the fact that it's been the same signature and the same story for the past two years. So here's that story. Every time that BTC tops, we tend to have a signature that looks relatively like this. And then that's the top. Or And then that's the top. So check this out. Relatively equal highs, sweep of the highs, fall back through. This was a loss of four hour 200s. Oh, look, in hindsight, that was the top downtrend. Relatively equal highs, consolidation, breakout, try to rally, get that last little, you know, smidgen of uh, crumbs of percentage to rally into level to level, and then test that level. Oh, we lost the range. We also lost two hour 200s. Granted, we did chop them up again after the fact, but never made a higher high. That was the top. That's what happened after. Same exact thing. This is equal highs. That's a sweep of the high, fall back through, lose local trend. We actually lost high time frame trend as well. Those were four hour 200s here, which act, acted as the bottom and confluence with this region as well. We lost four hour 200s. Oh, look, in hindsight, that was the top. Same exact kind of thing, which by the way, you could even say it for this as well. This is consolidation, relatively equal highs. We lost the four hour 200s. We tried to rally. We fall back through. We lose four hour 200s, top. Consolidation, sweep of the highs, fall back inside of the range, lose local trend, top. This was context was four hour 200s is what we were looking for. That is the analysis that we made at that time. We even said, hey, pretty nice range high confluence along with that region. Let's look for higher highs from there. Continuation trend is still intact, whatever, but regardless, that's still a local top. Same exact thing. Relatively equal highs, sweep of the highs, fall back through, lose four hour 200s right there, top. Sweep of the highs, relatively equal highs, right? Fall back through, deviation, loss of local trend, still bearish retesting four hour 200s, but lost the local trend after deviating back inside of the range, and that was the top. Same exact thing, consolidation, relatively equal highs, try to rally outside, fall back through, lose local trend, four hour 200s are somewhere in here, lose that as well. And oh, look, in hindsight, that was the top. Same exact signature, relatively equal highs, sweep those highs, fall back through, lose local trend once again, because high time frames were still bearish. That was still a perfect bearish retest of four hour 200s. We lost that local trend. Suddenly we're downtrending on all time frames again. Then we lose the range. Oh, in hindsight, that was the top. Same exact signature, relatively equal highs. Try to rally through, fall back inside of the range, shift structure bearishly, lose local trend, lose high time frame trend, fall below the range. Oh, in hindsight, that was the top. Same exact signature, same exact signature. 
time and time and time and time again. Every single major top. We have to see the weakness. So here's where someone who is very um, intuitive goes, Mercury, well, obviously those are going to be the tops because that's going to be the case at every single top. Of course, we're always going to lose key levels, fall back below ranges, lose key moving averages, fall through the bottom of the range, so on and so forth. Of course, Mercury, duh, because it was a top. And to that, I say, that's the point. Exactly. You proved my point. You're helping me prove my point. When we see the same things over and over and over and over and over again, we get to acknowledge the weakness as it forms, as it comes to fruition, as it gets compounded onto, as those bearish arguments begin to scale. Yeah, that's going to happen at tops. So when we watch that happen in current day, or maybe a week from now, or maybe maybe I'm wrong in two months from now, or whatever it may be, we want to acknowledge it. Because that has to happen at tops. Duh. That's the point. So it's, you know, it's a catch-22. Of course, that's going to happen at the top. Because it was the top. So we had to break down below key levels and lose key moving averages and, and break structure bearishly and, and then fall below ranges and blah, blah, blah. Of course, because it was the top. Exactly. So if it happens again, we want to say, oh, shit, weakness is probably weakness. Let's not just write it off and hope and pray that maybe negative 25% from here will still find a higher low in the weekly chart. Oh, yeah, that's probably a major top. Let's adjust. Let's adapt our form of execution. Let's stop looking to buy buy dips on local trends because, oh, they're probably above us. So there's no dip to buy, right? We're not buying a dip. We're buying into a downtrend and hoping that support does the bare minimum and access support, right? A pullback into this region, assuming that 200 dailies are still here and not confluent with this region, you're not buying a dip at this support level. You're buying support. You're buying into a downtrend and, and at a support level where it makes sense to support price. It makes sense for people who shorted to take profit. It makes sense for people who want a dollar cost average to come in and buy at support levels. It makes sense for people who want to uh, take scalp longs to try and buy at support for a nice quick three, four, five percent bounce. That's what you're doing. Know the difference between a dip, a pullback and a downtrend. Here's the other thing that I want to discuss. Mercury, what do you think about the ETH ETF narrative? Because, uh, you know, it's pretty pretty straightforward. We had BTC, spot ETF. That kind of speculation allowed for this crazy rally, right? It's totally not because there were more buyers than sellers. It's because the spot ETF, right? That That's why. Um, so clearly... Right. The next logical kind of narrative is now Ethereum ETF, right? Because the BTC one got approved. So maybe the Ethereum one will get approved. And BlackRock already filed for it, right? BlackRock, they're like 189 and, and one against the SEC for approvals. Wow, really good chances. What do you think about that? I think I don't care. That's what I think. I think that a narrative is just a narrative. I think that the reason that the number went up is because there were more buyers and sellers and not because of a narrative. Here's the thing. You want to say, oh, number went up because of BTC spot ETF, right? That's the narrative. We have known, right? If you've had any kind of comprehensive ability and, and humility, you have known since here that BTC spot ETF had a 90% chance of approval in January, by January. You've known that since July. But wait, that was the reason for this rally on, on BTC. That's the reason that BTC rallied 80%. Don't you remember, Mercury? Because the fake spot ETF approval came out, and that's what made people want to say, oh, shit, I'm probably underexposed, and that's what led the rally. Don't you remember that, Mercury? Wait, so why did price go down for all of these two or three months? Because I, I don't know, when the fake spot ETF approval came out and everyone's like, oh my God, wait, maybe I'm underexposed to BTC. I'm like, wait, you guys didn't know that you were underexposed to BTC some from three months ago? 
You didn't know that the same shit that we're saying today that we also said three months ago is the same shit that we're saying. And it's the same expected outcome that, hey, maybe you're probably sidelined, maybe you're underexposed, and maybe, right, maybe a spot ETF is a good narrative to, to run this up. And, right, and that has a really high chance of being approved by January. You didn't, what? What happened? Why did you neglect it for the past three months? What, what suddenly changed exactly? Because some random ass intern just suddenly decided to tweet about price or, you know, a fake news event? How? How does that, right? The, the spot ETF, the fake spot approval came out and people are like, oh, now we know what happens. Now we know what happens when a spot ETF gets approved. Ha ha. At least now we know. What? You thought a spot ETF would get approved and we would immediately go down? We would immediately, oh, pfft, no one cares about a spot ETF. That's not bullish. Negative 10% daily candle. What? What do you mean? How? What about these three months? Because we were saying the same shit that we've been saying for those three months. What changed here? The narrative. The price, right? Price changed. The direction changed. So now suddenly, what's the reasoning for that direction change? Oh, it must be because of the spot ETF. Narratives are fucking bullshit. They are reasons for humans to comprehend things so that they can justify things to their own puny little guts, just like mine, my puny little gut, so that I can fully justify why I'm positioned the way that I am. Because otherwise, without that narrative attachment, I wouldn't be able to comprehend, wait, why am I, why am I so heavy exposed to BTC in my spot ledger? What the fuck am I doing exactly? Why, why would I do that? Why am I so, what? Why am I bullish on this? That's why. That's why narratives exist. And here's my point. I don't give two fucks about what's happening uh, in terms of narratives. I don't care if you tell me Bitcoin is going up because spot ETF. I don't care if you tell me it's going up because it's the new digital gold. I don't care if you tell me it's going to be the newest uh, world form currency. I don't care if you tell me that you just like the color orange and Bitcoin is orange. And I don't know, it just looks cool, right? And you just really love the letter B with the cash sy symbol uh, in between it, right? I don't know. I don't give two fucks. If we're uptrending, I agree. As long as we're uptrending, as long as price action agrees with whatever narrative that you just told me, I agree. Market never lies, right? I don't care. You could tell me Bitcoin is going up because the color orange. I just really love the color orange. Or maybe there's a koala stuck in a tree somewhere in Australia. And for whatever reason, that's just really bullish. I don't know. It's just super fucking bullish. And here's my point. When you ask me, hey, what do you think about the Ethereum ETF narrative, blah, blah, blah. I agree. But I don't agree because I actually agree. I agree because the chart agrees. If suddenly the chart stops agreeing, I don't give two fucks about the spot ETF narrative, just like I didn't when we were downtrending for these three months, right? Because the chart didn't agree. Here's my point. In May, oh wait, I typed in May. In May of 2021, beautiful thing happened. A very, very beautiful thing, which by the way, this happened... <clears throat> after Bitcoin had topped, right? Bitcoin topped in April, that's here. This is what Ethereum Classic and also Ethereum did in the next month. <clears throat> I don't know, maybe we're starting to see something similar. Um, so something beautiful happened for Ethereum Classic in May of 2021. You know what the narrative was during this rally? Retail is here. The stupidest of the stupidest plebs have come to buy our bags. Your, your friends from high school are starting to ask you about crypto again. When you told them to buy at $3,000 Bitcoin, they told you it was a Ponzi and that their asset manager told them to stay as far away from crypto as they possibly could. But now suddenly Bitcoin is 54,000 and they're suddenly interested in about uh, into crypto, right? They have come to buy our bags when they go log into their petty little Robinhood accounts, because that is the epitome of retail trading is Robinhood, right? Let me go buy some GameStop. Let me go buy some $500 calls on GameStop and GameStop is calling is trading at $12, right? That is the epitome of retail. 
when they go to log in to their Robinhood accounts, they're going to see Ethereum, $3,000, and Ethereum Classic, $30. Which one are they going to buy? They're going to buy Ethereum Classic. Why? Because they can get more Ethereum Classic because it's only $30. Whereas if they go buy Ethereum, they might, might not even be able to afford a full Ethereum because it costs $3,000. Wow, doesn't it feel so much better to own 100 coins than it does to only own 0 0.9? That was the narrative. You go back to 2021 timeline in May, you see everyone with any amount of respect in this industry echoing this narrative. Don't you know retails come to buy our bags? Don't you know that they're going to be buying this on Robinhood? Don't you know that they've come and they're going to buy Ethereum Classic over Ethereum? Don't you know? Don't you know? Don't you know? Narrative. You want to know what actually was the case? Can you guys see my screen right now? Do you see the Twitter? Uh, actually, let me just link it to you guys so you can all follow through. People in recording will be able to see this. I'm not sure if you guys will. Uh, hold on, wait, let me touch the VX Twitter. So please go click uh, that link. I promise you will not lose your bored apes from clicking that Twitter link. But please follow along with me. This is what actually happened. Ethereum, Ethereum Classic 24-hour trading volume hit $10 billion on Korean exchange Upbit Global. The volume is big, bigger than any other exchange. Don't know why coin market cap excludes up bit volume, but it does. I, th I think it still does to this day. Korea doesn't have institutional investors. So this pump was purely retail driven, usually not a good sign, which by the way, props to uh, Ki Young Ju. Uh, I probably butchered his name, but uh, he also tweeted this at the exact top for Ethereum Classic. So let's look at this. Ethereum Classic, uh, Korean won volume, $10 billion on up bit. The volume on Binance, which is number one, big boy, right? That's the exchange to beat, was 6.7 billion. Wait, so it was 130% greater than Binance. So $10 billion of volume was accounted for on a Korean exchange, not Robinhood. So it's not U.S. retail buying our bags and coming in to buy, right? And, and oh, they're going to log into the Robinhood accounts and buy Ethereum Classic. It was Koreans on an only Korean exchange were buying Ethereum Classic. But wait, what was the narrative? What was the narrative, though? When you just look at the chart and you throw a very, very uh, straightforward right? Only just look at it this way, kind of narrative attached to it. How easy is it to subscribe to that narrative? Oh, yeah, numbers going up like crazy. It's just pumpy, super frothy, crazy, 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 up 30%, up the next day, another 35%, up the next day, another 100%. Yeah, no, uh, that must be US retail. That must be Westerners logging into the Robinhood accounts and saying, I'm going to buy Ethereum Classic and not Ethereum. My friend, a majority of the volume was accounted for on a Korean exchange. It's not US retail buying your bags. It was Korean retail. That was not the narrative though. How come nobody said, oh, Koreans have come to buy our bags? No, it was US people on Robinhood have come to buy our bags. Why? Maybe it was just easier to comprehend. And the chart was going up in tandem along with it anyways. So why the fuck does it matter? Why does it matter if it's US retail or Korean retail or I don't know, Japanese retail or right? I, I don't care who's buying our bags. Someone's buying our bags because number is going up. That's all I care about. So when you tell me, oh yeah, Robinhood, yep, the people are gonna, you know, the retail, US retail plebs, they're gonna log into the Robinhood accounts, they're gonna buy Ethereum Classic. And I'm long Ethereum Classic and, and Ethereum Classic is doing this, I agree. Yet, I just told you I agree, but when I go look at statistics, I can clearly prove, or actually disprove, that that's not actually what's happening. So here's my question to you. 
if something that can clearly be disproven, something as easy as just look at the volume, where's most of the volume taking place? Who's actually driving this, right? When you can clearly disprove something that easily, and yet people still get the narrative way fucking wrong. They could not have been more off the mark. Then how do you think it comes down when things start to become less speculative and they can't be disproven by actual statistics? What do you think then? How close do you think that people's narratives actually are to the reality? Please remember that at any given time, there's a million cogs turning in markets. There's a million. You cannot possibly try to comprehend every single one of those million cogs turning. It's not possible, right? You're going to drive yourself crazy. How is each cog turn? How fast is it turning? And then what three or four or five cogs is it moving in tandem along with that it's also turning, right? Uh, beautiful harmony with. You can't do that. It's not possible. When you just look at price, you just look at this. It's just one cog turning. It's pretty simple. Yeah, number go up like crazy. We're heading to the top right corner, whatever. We need to have the ability to look at like three or four cogs turning to be able to justify why price is doing something, why we can anticipate it to do something, and why uh, when it stops doing whatever it's doing, we can invalidate that something. Three or four cogs. It drives me crazy that instead of having a very clear cut disciplinary, hey, this will always work long term kind of way of thinking, and that's going to be one of my three or four cogs, people substitute one of those three for narratives. Narratives, things that you cannot prove nor disprove, but you just love to subscribe to because man, it is so fun to have an opinion on something. It really is. Man, it's, I love having an opinion on something right? We're all human. We love to have opinions on things. You know, the best way to get to know somebody is to ask them questions about themselves. And they just randomly start talking. And they will just ramble about themselves for 30 minutes straight. And then at the end of the conversation, they're like, you know what? I like you. I, I really like you. You're, you seem like a cool dude. And you're like, dude, I haven't said anything. I I've talked for two minutes of the past 30 minutes. You've rambled for the rest of it about yourself. And that's why you like me. You just love to have opinions on things. It doesn't work. It's not sustainable. You cannot get by attaching narratives to things and hoping and praying to the market gods that the way that the millions of cogs that are turning are turning synonymously. Uh, I don't, wait, I used that wrong. There's a different word that I wanted to use. Are turning uh, harmoniously in tandem with your narrative. So... The conclusion, it's better to just respect the chart. And any a narrative that you can attach along with the chart fits. As long as the shoe fits, it is what it is. Once the shoe stops fitting, you better have the discipline and the will to detach from your silly little narrative. U.S. retail was not the people buying here. It was Korean. But that was not the narrative. That was clearly, easily disproven. So how do you think other narratives go? When things cannot be as easily disproven as volume, literal, factual data, statistics. That's my point. That's always going to be 100% of the time my stance on narratives, by the way. I will simply just respect my system. If the narrative is right or not, it doesn't matter. My system will always be right anyways. So why the fuck do I care? Hopefully that is um, very clear. All right. So now, now we can get into the Friday altcoins watch list. Um, one second. Let me take a little bit of a break, uh, get a sip of water. You guys can reset, go grab some water, come back, and uh, we'll jump back into that in the meantime, or in the near future. Give me one second here. <clears throat> 
Does anyone have any questions, comments, requests, anything? Uh, I don't want to go too far into this, um, but uh, you know, any anything quick that I can answer very for you very quickly. I'm not taking requests because we're going to go through the entire watch list anyways. Which type of water do you drink? Uh, actually, that's a great question. So I learned. <laughs> he said, don't say it. Um, <clears throat> I recently was informed, not recently, about a year ago, year or two ago, was informed that if you drink, um, if you drink regular purified water, you're actually stripping your body of nutrients because water is kind of like a magnet. And it, it magnetizes to nutrients in your body. So a lot of the time what happens is it's grabbing all the magnesium and all these different nutrients from your body. And then when you go and pee, you pee out those nutrients along with it. So what you have to do is you have to add minerals and vitamins and nutrients uh, to your water so that as you're drinking, you're actually replacing those nutrients and giving your body nutrients. So if it has the nutrients already, it won't strip your body from the nutrients that you already have. Um, so I drink a water that is purified by a, um, by a, a bunch of minerals. I don't know exactly, um, which ones, but it goes through a, a filter and it's not a chemical filter. It's, it's like, like things like charcoal are, are filtering out the water. Uh, it sounds ridiculous, but I did a lot of research on this before I did it. And, um, yeah, I, I can't. Maybe it's um, secret to trading is mineral water. <laughs> Maybe it's a placebo effect. I'm totally open to that idea, but I have felt a lot more hydrated ever since I've switched over. Um, so, so yeah, it is tap water that gets filtered through a regular kind of like, you know, sink filter. And then from that filter, I then filter it into a pitcher that then filters it with minerals. And then I drink mineral, mineral water. So it gets filtered twice. Yeah. Water alpha, by the way, go do the research on it. I'm, I'm telling you, it's a, it's a big thing. I basically only drink water, by the way. I have one cup of coffee in the morning. That's it. I drink water for the rest of the day. I tend to drink about a gallon or half a gallon of water a day. <clears throat> water alpha <laughs> yeah it was a nice break all right sorry for that uh so four second rule and pertaining that to trying to find outperformers in the market and so the way that this goes is within four seconds you need to be able to tell me which way is this chart headed so clearly as it stands at the moment this is still uptrending on this kind of time frame uh, only if we were to zoom in, would we see the weakness. But the idea is we want to find things that are outperforming. We know they're uptrending on, on whatever time frame that they're uptrending. We understand the context because right they're uptrending on all time frames, or maybe it looks better than BTC. Uh, within kind of four seconds of looking at that chart, we can fully comprehend those ideas. And then we will label those coins outperformers. Um, so let me get my notepad here. All right, so you guys ready for this? Uh, last week, we found HBAR, Optimism, TIA, SUI, ARB, INJ, SEI, Phil, Lido, Stax, Rose, Mina, SSV, and then honorable mentions were Solana, Blur, Near, and Beam. So we will go through, we will try and find new coins, and uh, we will more, more than likely find a lot of the same coins. Um, so let's do that. Space bar. Does Ethereum look better or worse than BTC? And obviously we already said it looks better. So I'm honestly, I'm gonna add Ethereum to the watch list. It's no longer trading in a range. It is now breaking out of the range, whereas BTC is deviating back inside of the range. And remember that Ethereum is still bullish on much higher time frames. So that means that Ethereum is bullish on all time frames. That is an outperformer. So we wanna add that to the watch list. Give me one second. I do this by hand. 
most of the things that I journaled in trading were always by hand. <clears throat> Solana, this was an honorable mention. Uh, it still is going to be an honorable mention because it is still holding this high time frame trend of four hour 200s. It is not an outperformer, by the way. Uh, but if it breaks out of this region, then it will become an outperformer because at that point we get to target. It's not drawn for whatever reason, but 125 resistance level. And then if we break out of 125, we get to target 200. So it goes from, oh, wait, it was lagging, right? It was, it was kind of in the same kind of gist as BTC to now suddenly one thing happened and we get to scale our assumptions drastically higher to look for 125 and maybe 200 from there. So I'm still going to add it as an honorable, honorable mention. You could opt to trade Solana along high time frame trend and hope and pray that it eventually goes on to become an outperformer in the near future. Remember that we said this somewhere around here last Friday. And then so since then, it tested that region, blah, 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 yada, yada, right? Um, but that is the, the same kind of gist here today. You can try and trade high time frame trend and hope that eventually it becomes an outperformer. But that does not mean it is an outperformer. H bar. So this is actually kind of starting to break down a little bit. I'm suddenly less interested in this than I was last Friday. So this is not one that held up since then. Two hour, 200 MAs trend, high time frame uh, trend portrayal. I do believe that's what we were using. And so with this loss of that trend and breakdown below the range, we are now bearish retesting it. And only after we reclaimed that trend would be able to say plan A, plan B, plan A part two. So we could add H bar again, uh, but it would be an honorable mention. It actually is bearish at the moment. The only way that it would catch my interest is if it stopped being bearish at the moment, which means that it would actually go back to being bullish on all time frames. So that's why it would be interesting. But as it stands, this is actually a deviation back inside of a very, very, very high time frame range from here to there. Actually, sorry, that's mid range. This is range low. So that's not a good thing. This is actually a um, bearish retest, a uh, short entry. For those of you who are looking to take swing shorts, that's actually uh, a pretty clear cut entry there. You would be invalidated upon reclaiming two hour 200s and breaking into higher highs. And that's also where things flip bullish again. And we get to assume expansion away from this ma uh, massive range again. So. We can add H bar, but it is going to be an honorable mention. It's not something that I'm going to look to execute off of anytime soon. Certain things need to happen, right? That's the gist. Let's go back to four hour and MNT. What the hell is this? Not something I'm going to trade because what the hell is that move? <clears throat> Optimism. So this, uh, Trade idea was from Friday Altcoins Watchlist. Clearly, it's holding through today. Uh, we're starting to threaten breaking out of these like equal highs, this resistance level. Uh, this box is supposed to be gray, gray box. <laughs> uh, so now we're looking for uptrend continuation into price discovery. That is the appeal there. So buying the demand zone confluence, buying the four hour 200s in tandem, we can target price discovery, which means we get to target infinite gains we only have to stop targeting infinite gains if weakness is shown to some degree. So uh, it was on watch list last week. It's going to be on watch list this week as well. Because clearly the idea is playing through. So we just kind of look to play into the exact same idea. Sui, this was also on the watch list last week. Uh, four hour 200 MAs trend for SUI, and we tested that trend. We also tested range lows as confluence along with it. And this was the crazy reaction that we were given. So if it was on the watch list last week, it has only followed through with our thoughts since then. So we would probably go, go ahead and add it to the watch list this week as well, right? It is threatening price discovery. This is the last real resistance on the chart. Uh, kind of these lows and then those highs, that's the last real resistance. We break out of that region, we get to pull out FIB extensions and, and target drastically higher prices. So another banger. 
right? I get to keep it moving. Dot looked interesting, but I'm going to hold off on that. Arb, this is another thing that we added to the watch list. I do believe for Arb, it was two hour 200s, I want to say. Uh, it was either two hour or one hour. I don't exactly remember. Uh, regardless, the trend is not as clear to me as it is for things like Lido or Optimism or SSV, uh, which I'm sure Lido and SSV will also find their way on the watch list again this week as well. But, uh, you know, we did add it to the watch list and say, hey, even if we don't know how to trade this, this is probably a pretty good uh, coin to be interested in. And so far, so good. This is a new all-time high, I believe. Yeah. So how can you break into price discovery and not find your way on Friday altcoins watch list? It just doesn't really make a lot of sense, right? It's clearly outperforming. So we need to respect that uh, moving forward as well. I'm going to say two hour 200s are probably the high time frame trend portrayal to move. Uh, to use moving forward from here. I'm not entirely certain on what we said last week. We might've said hourly. Yeah, actually, I think I did say hourly. It would have been either hourly or something obscure, like 45 minute or whatever. Uh, and then, you know, that would be plan A, plan B, plan A part two, right? Again, wasn't as clear cut to me as things like Optimism or Lido. Uh, but we will, of course, add it to the watch list and keep it moving. So I and J, uh, it's not necessarily outperforming anything crazy as of recent, but we have formed a range here and our four hour 200s are still being respected as a nice high time frame trend. Remember, this is really the same analysis that we made way back where, uh, where it's not really outperforming per se, but if we break out of this range, it will become an outperformer. So if it breaks out of the range, we get to target price discovery again. That's probably a good thing. And we probably want to add it to the watch list for that reason alone. Right. So same exact concept that we applied back here, which has also been the same concept that we've been applying for INJ since all the way back here when we were saying, hey, there's only really three or four coins in the market that look good against BTC at the moment. Right. INJ was one of those coins and it continues to be. There's not really been any significant weakness. There has not been a high time frame trend loss, right? A shift in high time frame trend. It has only been this time frame starts to go neutral. And that's more bearish than if we were just going up on every single time frame, obviously. But that's not necessarily a good bearish argument, right? So we lose local trend and then we adapt and then so eventually we find our way into plan a plan b plan c hey maybe we're just going sideways and then with this most recent push the range has been very clear or has become very clear so now we have range lows along with four hour 200s and range highs at around 44. if we break out of 44 we get to target price discovery all over again if you were ever going to assume that we would break out of the range to begin with it would be along four hour 200s, right? That would be the most ideal entry point and in tandem with those range lows. So INJ makes its way onto the watch list yet again. <clears throat> All right. SEI, this is still uptrending, right? And if we break into a higher high, that is price discovery. So we probably want to keep an eye on this. Four hour 200s are a good high time frame trend to be using, but they are totally irrelevant as of recent. So we want to scale assumptions and not be so inactionable and wait for four hour 200 MA retests. We need to zoom in to lower time frames and see what's going on there. So when we go look at something like maybe hourly, okay, that doesn't really catch these lows all that well. So they're not really all that locally relevant. Uh, so maybe we'll go to 45 minute and then say, oh, okay, maybe 45 minute looks a lot better. And we go to 30 minute. Oh, okay. Maybe, maybe you want to use 30 minute instead. It doesn't really matter here, but the gist is we had that low time frame trend, uh, kind of assumption we lose it. So that makes it, that makes us think, Hey, we can pull back into four hour 200s. We can see that higher time frame trend retested. We're still at bullish. We're still threatening price discovery, higher highs, continuation, blah, blah, blah. Just not on this particular time frame, right? And then we reclaim those 30 minute or 45 minute 200 moving averages. And then we're like, oh, actually, we're not going to get that bullish retest. That was the low. Run it back turbo from here. 
And then we lose that exact same local trend all over again. So check this out. You make one analysis on SEI, right? Or on say, and, uh, and you're right. You're right for about two weeks or so and a crazy amount of percentage. 200%. Two weeks, 200%, one analysis. Now suddenly you have in the span of a week, you've made one, two, three different analysis in the span of maybe a 10% range. Wait, 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 wait. Let's recap. Two weeks, 200%, one analysis. One week, 10% range, three different analysis. What's happening? Your system that is previously winning and it was previously alpha is no longer alpha. It now fucking sucks. If you continue to use it, assume that as a trader, you're going to fucking suck, right? That's just logic, right? Stops working, <coughs> we probably want to stop using it. So instead, the analysis on, on say, <coughs> well, I need a minute here. All right. Excuse me, guys. I've not fully recovered from my cold. There's still a, <clears throat> a little bit of a cough hanging in the back. It won't go away. All right. <clears throat> the analysis on say becomes we are just simply ranging. And if and when we break out of the range entirely, then we get to assume uptrend continuation. As long as we're still inside the range, maybe we don't get that deeper pullback, right? As long as we're still inside the range, maybe we do break down below the range, and then we are going to see that deeper pullback, right? That's how we think. So range lows are range lows. Range highs are range highs. We're probably just going to continue ranging. We're probably not going to care about your 30 minute or your 45 minute 200s all that much, right? If and when we break out of the range towards the upside or the downside, we get to tie that in with our higher time frame context. Higher time frame context is if we break up, we threaten price discovery. If we break down, we threaten deeper pullback into four hour 200s. So similar to I and J, we're ranging. If we break out of the range, we're in price discovery, we get to target infinite kinds of gains. So it's not an outperformer, but it has the potential to drastically outperform. So we can justify adding it to the watch list, at least as an honorable mention, right? At least. <clears throat> Lots of squiggles there on SNX. <clears throat> All right. So blur was an honorable mention as well, uh, because this was a high time frame range. And as long as we traded inside of this range, we still threaten the idea of uptrend continuation on a greater time frame. So now we're breaking out of that range, we get to look for level to level, which meant that above 55 cents, we probably get to target 69. And then above 69, we get to target whatever the next major resistance level is, which in this case, there really isn't one, right? So above 69 or 70 cents, we get to target price discovery. That's pretty crazy. Probably want to pay attention to blur just for that reason alone. <clears throat> so furthermore, it's not just an honorable mention. It's not just, oh, it may go on to show strength from here. And if it does, it'd be very interesting. Now it has shown strength. Now it has broken out of that range. Now we do get to assume, hey, maybe we go to 69 cents from here. That's a 20% move in itself. Actually, that's a 30%, right? Uh, yeah, 30% move. So maybe it goes 30% higher. And that's really the minimum that we would expect. That's just a very clear cut level to level. We don't have to scale assumptions or, you know, that's not even assuming a breakout above that region. If we break out of that region as well, now suddenly we get to target drastically higher prices. Probably want to have some kind of interest towards Blur for those reasons. So Blur has now moved its way up from honorable mention into one of the main coins that we should look to trade. And honestly, uh, that breakout pullback retest <clears throat> is pretty clear. So that's a, that's a nice local trend trade to scale assumptions into so whatever the local trend looks like, 
maybe he, at this point it's pretty parabolic. It's not even 15 minute 200s. It's 10 minute 200s. So these 10 minute 200s lined up as confluence with the range highs. Those have acted as those lows on the way up so that we could break out above the range in the first place. They were perfectly confluent with the range highs when we pulled back to them here too. So maybe we just continue uptrending from here, right? And that would mean, oh shit, I, I wanted to buy the pullback on blur, but it just wouldn't give me a pullback. It was just, man, it just keeps going higher. Yeah, it's because we're trending along 10 minute 200s. You had to scale assumptions from 10 minute into the daily chart. That's how crazy we had to scale assumptions, right? There's nothing actionable for us on the daily. There's nothing actionable for us on the four hour. We don't have any confluence with four hour 200s and range highs, right? We don't have anything on the hourly even. There's nothing there for us, not even the 30 minute. The only price action that we could have played actionably would have been 10 minute 200 moving averages. If you're sitting here saying, Mercury, I don't even pay for TradingView Pro. I can't even look at 10 minute 200s. You can, you would just have to go to a different time frame and then figure out the calculation to get it to be 10 minute 200s. You just have to change the, the input number for your moving averages. You don't have to buy TradingView Pro. The only reason I buy TradingView Pro, by the way, is because I don't want you guys to have to experience an ad to pop up in the left left corner uh, every five minutes as we stream. <clears throat> Otherwise, I would not pay for TradingView Pro. Let's, uh, let's get that clear. You just paid your yearly subscription. Did you do the, um, <clears throat> what's it called? Why can't I think of it? Black Friday? Did you do that? That's what I did. Merc refund? And you got rugged. Sorry. <laughs> nah, I was very adamant that I would never buy TradingView Pro. The only reason that I bought it is for, for you guys. So I'm still waiting for one of you guys to reimburse me for my, my TradingView Pro purchase, actually. I'm still waiting on that. I'm kidding. Don't send me anything. Uh, four hour, 200 moving averages for Phil, pretty clear cut. Uh, I think actually one of you just talked about this. Uh, Hey man, mind checking out Phil? I'm not sure if you already have, but mind giving you a quick recap if you do. <clears throat> um, yeah, so this is Phil still uptrending. This is not really clean. I don't like to see that, but if anything, it would be plan A, plan B. And then this was plan A part two. So plan A part two would be buy the pullback retest of four hour 200s and assume continuation anyways. So this is not ideal. This is not right. I can't honestly tell you that if you bought Phil here along four hour 200s, you would not have gotten stopped out here. In all honesty, I probably had my stop loss right below this low, which means I got stopped out on the bottom. So from there, we need to break back above that trend and then reclaim it and retest it. And then I'm allowed to say, okay, re-entry here, hide stop below here same exact thesis as all of this uptrend prior. And then hopefully we go on to create higher highs and we're right. So Phil is still interesting. I am going to add it again. Oh, whoops. Notice how here's the alpha guys. Here's the alpha in the stop process. We're not paying attention to algo. We're not paying attention to GST. We probably want to pay attention to Maker, right? Honestly, this price action is so fucking... What is even happening on this chart? I don't even know. I'm going to leave Maker off of it for that reason. Because what the hell even is this? Uh, I can't tell you the last time that I traded Maker. I think it was somewhere over... I want to say it was somewhere over here. I think Maker was responsible for me reaching new all-time highs somewhere back in October in my portfolio. Uh, but other than that, man, it's... This price action just looks fucking hideous. Maker is very much algorithmic driven kind of price action. So I tend to want to stay away from it. And even though this is clearly an outperformer today, I'm still going to stay away from it. But notice how we're not paying attention to IDU or ID. Notice how we're not paying too much attention uh, to Aptos. Actually, this looks pretty decent. Yeah, I take this back. It looks pretty decent. Four hour 200s, plan A, that's plan B. This is plan A part two. We get to assume that's a deviation back inside of this range. Four hour 200s reclaim into here. And if we just continue that uptrend level to level, Aptos looks pretty good. We can pay attention to Aptos. But notice how we're not paying attention to... So we can actually add Aptos to um, honorable mentions. I am going to do that. <clears throat> 
We're not paying attention to AGIX. Maybe you can pay attention to IMX. We don't really want to pay attention to PIP. Don't want to pay attention to TRX. Don't want to pay attention to Aave. We don't. I got carried away. You can maybe pay attention to this. This is breaking out of a key range. Uh, again, this is kind of choppy. This is not something that I'm personally going to want to trade because the analysis, even though it's clear what's happening, hey, we're breaking out of the range. This is a pretty key trend. Maybe we pull back. I'm sorry. Maybe this pullback uh, is a higher low and then we get to target higher highs. It's not the cleanest chart in the world, right? I much prefer something that looks like I and J. If I'm going to be trading a range, I want, to, I want it to be very clear cut, even a four-year-old understands that it's ranging. This is one of those charts where if I ask a four-year-old, um, what, what do you think is happening here? And let's say I ask 10 four-year-olds. Four of them might tell me it's going up. Four of them might tell me it's going down. The other two might tell me I don't know what's, what's happening, right? So what does that tell me? It's probably going sideways. But to me, is that clear? No, not really. To me, it's just not clear. It's not clean. Some of you are saying, Mercury, this looks very clean to me. I know exactly what's happening. I know how I want to trade this. I know where I want to hide my stop. I know what's my key uh, ideal entry. I know what to target afterwards. That's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Personally, space bar. Let's go to the next. Notice how I'm not even giving VRA the time of day. Notice how I'm not going to give AXS the time of day. Right? Notice how I'm not going to give sweat the time of day. That's the alpha here. We're not paying attention to things that don't warrant our attention. We are paying attention to things that warrant our attention. If that is your forefront foundation, you have set the foundation good, right? So that when you add anything on top of it, you have a higher chance of success. So Ethereum Classic actually looks really good. Uh, on very high time frames, this looks fucking phenomenal. Uh, this, these are 200 daily moving averages, and this trend is incredibly clean. So this reclaim of trend, I think we discussed this before. Uh, this reclaim of trend is pretty pretty significant. All it needed was to break out of this range, and we did. Unfortunately, we did so in the span of two or three candlesticks, so there's not really an actionable kind of analysis to be had here unless we pull back into that major demand zone, and then we find some kind of high time frame trend confluence along with it, Right, maybe four hour 200s line up here, and then we can look to play into that drastically higher time frame analysis. But regardless, it is still a major outperformer as of today. Right, just last week, the context was totally different. We had reclaimed a very key trend, but we were still capped inside of a year and a half long range. So that has now changed. We are now bullish on all time frames for Ethereum Classic. <clears throat> There's lots of uh, lots of breakdown pullback. I'm sorry, breakdown, reclaim, pullback, retest, continuation trades to be had here. We've we've passed by quite a couple that look like Aptos. So if you want to trade one, you can trade them all. Uh, near, so near tested four hour two hundreds. I don't think that that's the trend portrayal that we were using though. Was it? We're using two hour. I'm gonna say I think we were using two hour for a near. I'm pretty sure we were. Um, when we reclaim two hour two hundred moving averages, we're gonna look for. That's plan A. It worked for all of that price action and crazy percentages towards the upside. This is plan B. Hey, maybe let's look for deeper pullbacks into something like six hour 200s, 12 hour 200s, whatever, uh, you know, $2 demand zones, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so far, we're still in plan B per my way of thinking. We've reclaimed a local trend, right? So there's a local downtrend where we're kind of pinching. Locally, we're bullish, but still on this time frame, we're still threatening downtrend continuation. All it needs is losing that local trend again. And suddenly we're still fulfilling our plan B kind of thesis. In order to invalidate that, uh, we need to reclaim two hour 200s. We need to get back above this supply zone and flip it into support again. And if that happens, not only does that invalidate the bearish argument, but at the exact same time, we're also going back into the bullish one, which is the same argument that we've been making for several months now for near because it has found its way onto these watch lists. Uh, you know, 
at least a couple times. <clears throat> so reclaiming, uh, that would be the area of interest. And then that would be the trigger. And this would quickly go back to being an outperformer amongst all time frames. We eradicate all the bearish, you know, fears, blah, blah, blah. And then we get to target continuation. Same winning mindset that won for the past three months. So near is at least going to be honorable mention. Actually, it is going to be honorable mention because it needs something to happen. And then once that something happens, it becomes very interesting. <clears throat> oh, that's Lido. That looked really good. So Lido USDT, very, very strong coin. We said two hour, 200 MAs trend. So exact same setup here before it came into fruition, before we tested those two hour 200s. Beautiful kind of way of thinking. Uh, high stop technically was supposed to be below this low. We scaled assumptions to say, eh, as long as it's below these bodies of the wick and then the actual two hour 200s themselves, we're probably fine. And that's a, a moment where our scaling of assumptions actually paid off and it paid off big, right? Because that's what the setup looks like. So we get to target whatever we get to target because Lido is breaking out of a very, very significant uh, region. We get to target price discovery. So we get to target, let's just say we are targeting five bucks, right? That's what the setup looks like per our way of scaling those assumptions. Please understand what I'm saying by that. If instead we took the actually technically kind of approach to it, right? It's still perfectly valid because we're playing into the exact same concept. But look what happens to our RR. To our RR. Wow. I hate, I hate saying that string of words. Look what happens. It gets cut by 60%, right? It goes from 11 R to now only four. So we have now made up the crazy difference. And again, this is all there for you. This is all, these are rough drafts. These are actual tangible thoughts that we can put into practice, hopefully winning mindset. And then we get to come back next week and see, oh shit, it actually won. And then hopefully it's vindicating your way of thinking if you're starting to develop a mindset to go about markets so that you're seeing this happen over time, over and over and over again, week after week, months in a row, we see as winners continue to win on average, and then you get to implement it yourself, your own form of thinking, your own system, your own approach, your own entries, stop loss, take profit, right? Scaling of assumptions, et cetera, right? Pros and cons kind of way of thinking. I hope that is the case, but that is still the case for Lido. There's not a reason for me to deviate away from the winning mindset that won last Friday. So we're going to apply it again moving forward. Lido finds its way onto the watch list yet again. <clears throat> STX. Uh, somebody asked me, hey, Mercury, I know that you're still in STX. You took profit at $2. I was updating that trade on Twitter. Um, I am still in STX. It still looks perfectly fine. <coughs> Obviously, STX is higher beta to BTC, and BTC is not looking too hot right now. However, I don't really see an issue with STX. Uh, it still looks pretty damn good to me, uh, as long as you know we hold significant um, levels, and it looks perfectly fine, and still deserves to be on the watch list. Right, it's still an uptrending chart. Um, what are trend portrayals? Are they four hour 200s? I don't remember. No, it's two hour 200s. So two hour 200s are trend portrayal. We said, uh, neglect the wick. And, uh, as long as we hold two hour 200s in this demand zone, generally speaking, somewhere in this region, I would imagine there's demand because there's relatively equal highs. So as long as we hold this general region, we're still okay. If we start to break structures, then I probably don't want to be holding on to S STX, right? Cause at that point, we probably are going to go level to level. That's how we would scale those assumptions. So for now, STX is still perfectly fine. It's still an outperformer just as it was since last Friday and the Friday before and the Friday before and the Friday before. <clears throat> my, my voice is starting to give out, guys. We got to wrap this up sooner than later. You can't hear me? Oh, no. 
Guys, someone please reply. Can you guys hear me? Is everything all good? Yes. Okay. That's all I needed. Thank you so much. <clears throat> all right. Appreciate that. Thank you. Nothing breaks my heart more than when there is a, an audio or a tech issue for one of these recordings, and then you guys can't can't watch the stream or whatever. I don't know what flow is, but that looks decent. It's probably not liquid enough for me to go trade it, I'm guessing. But as far as analysis goes, that's pretty clear. Yes, it is recorded. This, <laughs> this at the bottom left means that it's being recorded. Whether or not the audio actually works <laughs> after the recording uh, is to be, is you know, we're going to find that out. But it is at least being recorded. Rose. So four hour, 200 moving averages for Rose. Very high time or very clear high time frame trend. Still holding. Uh, actually put in a higher low. I'm sorry, a higher high just recently. So bouncing off of that trend. And now we're looking for that higher low and so that we can continue that uptrend uh, moving forward. So still looks perfectly fine. Uh, not ideal because there's not really any demand zone confluence other than local demand. So you have range lows kind of. Uh, somewhere in that region. That's the only confluence that you have uh, to your four hour 200 moving averages trend. And then we can look for continuation from there. If we lose both the range lows and the four hour 200s in, in one fluid motion, then suddenly we get to start assuming, oh shit, rose probably goes from here to next significant level, right? And the next significant level on the daily would probably be those range highs that have acted as range highs for like two years. <clears throat> so we could add rows again. What's that? One inch KDA looks very illiquid. Both of those coins look very illiquid. ICP, you will not catch me trading ICP. If I ever send out a trade idea on ICP, please check in on me. Please make sure I'm okay and I haven't been kidnapped. Uh, ENS, clearly this is an outperformer, but how the hell am I going to go and trade this other than the one minute or five minute chart? It's just not realistic. So I'm not going to include it because I'm not actually going to go to trade it, right? I don't care what it's doing. If I'm not going to trade it, there's no point in watching it. It's just taking up mental space for no reason. Same thing for Pendle. I'm just front running the Mercury. That that coin looks good. How come you skipped it? Well, that's why. I know you guys are going to have those questions because you're very intuitive. So, Four hour, 200 moving averages for Mina. Very, very good high time frame trend to be trading. And also confluence with a very high time frame range high. So the idea here for Mina was to buy four hour 200s, high stop below structure. You're also buying a very high time frame range highs confluence to that idea. We get to assume uptrend continuation, but we get to scale that to drastically higher assumptions because just a push into uh, this resistance level at like 150 ish again would be measly peanuts. And uh, we would really look for crazy expansion above that region to look for, right? There's not really much resistance here, at least on the buy bit chart, right? We're breaking out of a two year long range. So when we break out of a two year long range, we don't just want to look for a measly five, 10, 15, 20% move. We want to think big. And then if we're forced to start thinking smaller, the market will show us that, right? We'll lose four hour 200s, we'll break structures, we'll fall back inside of key regions, and then you lose one R. It's not that you're right 100% of the time. It's that the times that you are right drastically outweighs, right? That reward drastically outweighs the times that you're wrong. Assuming 50-50, the times you're right, you get 10 R. But 50-50, when you're wrong, you lose one. Wow, those are great trades to be taking. When it works, it works well. Think of INJ. Think of Solana. Think of Link, right? Think of SNX was a bad example. It gave us a 50% move. It's not even really a good example, 50%. I made like 6R from that trade. It was a bad example. It didn't do what I thought it would do, 6R, 
So when it works, it works well. These are appealing trades to want to take because we get to scale assumptions and think logarithmically, but from one precise key level. And if that precise key level is lost, we get to scale our assumptions drastically in the opposite direction. That is still the case for Mina, still shaping up, creating higher lows, created higher highs on local perspective. Trend's still perfectly intact. There's no reason this is, that this coin wouldn't make it onto the watch list yet again this week. <clears throat> SSV. Man, this looks good. I love it. Absolutely love it. So SSV, very high time frame trend. Uh, the way that I was playing this, I believe was, what trend was it? I thought it was hourly, but I might be wrong. What is my entry on SSV? I don't even remember. Was it hourly 200s? Was it two hour? I want to say, well, excuse me, I'm yawning. I want to say it was hourly. I want to say that's what I was trading. I am actually long on SSV. Uh, yeah, okay. So I did say hourly 200s. So hourly 200s pull back into this region. Now, clearly, they didn't line up perfectly, you know, butterflies, dandelions. Uh, but remember, there's, other, there's two other parts to the system. So the moving averages aspect of it did not hold, you know, clear cut. Oh my God, we got to buy the exact Pico bottom. Uh, but the other aspects of it held perfectly fine. We didn't break any structure. We didn't lose the key level. So that's why when we set stop losses, we want to try our best to play into all three aspects of my very complex three-part system. So looking for a continuation generally from this region, and then, right, we can go from there. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Now, the same concept can get applied here along hourly 200s, along with this demand zone into the next level and over and over and over until eventually the trend breaks. <clears throat> SSV is not pulling back into any higher time frame trends, though. Right. So the higher time frame trend portrayals are pretty irrelevant at the moment because we're so parabolic that we're not even pulling back to test them. I don't even know that I would be using four hour 200s, to be quite honest probably be using six hour. So six hour 200s, do we care about them? Ooh, not really, because we only tested them recently on that wick. And the time before that was back here. And the time before that was back here. So in all this other price action, you're just left inactionable, right? And only you, you only catch that move if you have bids set preemptively and waiting for some crazy spike down. So Scaling those assumptions, right? Using the hourly chart to play into the thesis on the six hour, which is portraying the daily trend, right? We're finding daily higher lows along six hour 200s. So notice how we're using six hour, right? To portray the idea on the daily and we're using the hourly to play into the idea on the six hour. So we're scaling those assumptions hourly into six hours, six hour into daily. Now we have a cohesive kind of thought process as to what SSV is doing. And we have an actionable way of executing off of that thought process. So SSV makes its way onto the watch list yet again. Banger trade. <clears throat> and that's Ethereum BTC. So I believe we've made our rounds. Oh, TIA, sorry. Uh, TIA, uh, this chart is not as clean. Uh, I can't honestly say that you would have been able to navigate this effectively in terms of actual execution. Uh, what we said was breakout pullback retest into this region, range highs, 30 minute 200s as confluence. Clearly that did not hold. So instead we deviated back inside of the range, went to mid range, and then that mid range test broke us back outside of the range all over again. And that's where we get to say, that's plan A, assume uptrend. If it looks like a breakout, it's probably a breakout. This is plan B. We've deviated back inside of the range. We get to assume mid range and then range lows. We also lost 30 minute 200s. And then plan A part two. Oh, wait, in hindsight, we only got to mid range. Here we are breaking out of the range all over again. We're respecting 30 minute 200s. Maybe we just continue breaking out, right? Maybe we get to resume price discovery. So it's not clear. It's not 
ideal, but it still works and it obviously is still an outperformer. TIA is also not something that I'm trading uh, from a derivative standpoint because I already have a lot of spot stacked away being staked at the moment. I think I told you guys this. Um, I think somebody brought it up. Like, uh, like how do you go about trading <clears throat> all these different positions? Like if you send out 15 different, you know, trade ideas on 15 different altcoins, how many are you actually taking? And the answer is discretionary based. That's the point. At any given time, there are a hundred setups for me to take in my system. I would hope that we're understanding that it's impossible for me to go and take them all. So the trade ideas is truly an idea. It is a blueprint. It is a rough draft. I'm not going to come back and claim clout on the ones that worked any more than I'm going to remind you of the ones that didn't, right? But it's an idea. It's a rough draft. Of those, I am executing off of them. Of those, there's going to be winners that go on to win, and I took them. There's going to be losers that go on to lose, and I took them. There's going to be winners that go on to win, and I didn't take them. There's going to be losers that go on to lose, and I didn't take them. It's just the way it is. I cannot possibly take all of the coins in the market that are, are you know showing setups for my system at any given time. It's just not possible. It's not realistic. I'm relating them back to my personal situation. What coins I'm more interested in trading for whatever reasons are intangible to me, right? Or at least to you. But I can grasp those concepts because I understand my personal situation. You can't grasp them because you're not me. This is the case for every single one of you individually. So I gave a very, very small example and I used TIA as that example. How come I longed SSV range, breakout, pullback, retest, local trend, look for uptrend continuation into price discovery. How come I took that trade, but TIA was the exact same setup and I didn't take the, the, the TIA setup? Why? Oh, because personally, I already own a shit ton of spot TIA. I don't own any spot SSV. So I'm going to go take SSV. I don't need more exposure to TIA. That personal situation, that small thing, something as tiny as that, has now drastically uh, differentiated how I approach my thoughts and ideas, right? And my setups that I have come to, to create the way that I'm approaching the market. So how do you think everything else impacts it? If something as simple as, oh, well, I already have spot position on this coin, drastically impacts how I'm approaching the market. How do you think time zones and overall exposure and income that I have and overall exposure to derivatives and right. How do you think all those variables impact me personally and differ from the next person, from the next person and the next person and the next person? It, it's infinite. It's infinite variables. This is why I do not subscribe to the idea of copy trading. This is why rather than just send Friday altcoins watch list, it would take me 15 minutes to do my own market scan. I do it live in front of you guys for an hour straight and then you get to see the process and you get to see the summary after the fact you got to see how we went from beginning to end and hopefully in an ideal world especially the past three months you get to see as that same mindset gets rewarded and hopefully you can start to adapt uh, adopt it and mold it into something of your own take the bits and pieces that you like throw away the ones you don't form your own process. And that way you're not waiting on me or anyone else to spoon feed you. Hey, I need my altcoin watch list, Mercury. It's Friday. Time's a ticking, right? I need the watch list. When are you going to put it up? You can go do it yourself. That's the point. Not giving you guys fish. My, my intent is to hope, hopefully teach you how to fish for yourselves. And I know that sounds very cliche, but I cannot emphasize enough how I've watched people be parts of paid groups. And even when the paid group does incredibly well, 80% of the members are still losing, still not making money. So when the group is not doing well, when the, the analysts are sending trades, hey, copy and do as I do, take this here, enter here, stop loss here, take profit here. And you get stopped out seven times in a row, 100% of the members are losing because they're all just copying what the other guy's doing. But then when the mem when the analyst starts winning 17 trades in a row, I kid you not, I kid you not, 17 win streak at one point, 
And then we put out a poll because uh, everyone was like, why is, you know, the members are pretty, like the morale is pretty low. It's really only like four or five people that are like really loud and euphoric and everyone else is kind of just like, like you would think we're, we've, you know, in a bear market, like negative 80%, like stable coins depegging, like what the hell is going on here with this morale? So we put out a poll and to our surprise, 80% of members said that they had not benefited in the past, however long within that 17 win, win streak, 80%. That's what really opened my mind to say, oh shit, this is not sustainable. And then you know what the rebuttal was from members? You know what the rebuttal was? Oh, but I'm learning so much from the live streams. What? You're paying $300 a month to, to educate yourself, but you're losing money month over month con consistently? What the fuck is the point? How are you justifying paying money then? What You're here to copy trade, you know, copy paste profit. What the hell is going on? Oh, it's almost as though that's not really realistic. You can't do that. But people love the education. They stayed for the live streams. They continued to to dish up $300 a month to, to watch the streams. What? You're, you're not benefiting. Cancel your subscription, please. Do yourself a favor. Learn how to fish for yourself. I, I want to say that the reason that that group failed, or actually several groups failed, is because we went in with the wrong approach. Tried to, to market themselves as copy, price, profit. You can do as I do, exactly as I do it, and you know, you'll make money. That's not realistic. I have taken a totally different approach and I've gotten to see the value that you guys have extracted. A, a good dozen or so of you consistently remind me of why I do things the way that I do them. And for that, I thank you. So you guys have vindicated that this is the correct way to go about this group, how we should operate, how we should think about things and right, the whole thought process and everything in between. So that I thank you. TIA makes its way on the watch list. It got absolutely chopped to hell. Can't honestly say that it wouldn't have been. Uh, but you know, personally, I didn't trade it either. That's just how it is. It's going to happen. There's going to be trades that I didn't take and they go on and, and are big, big winners, right? Just it is what it is. the end of the day, I can only hope that I'm providing as much value to you guys as efficiently as possible. And that's BTC. So with that, we have fully made our rounds. Uh, thank you for hearing out my rambling. I have a good amount of work ahead of me. Listen, let's go over last week's watch list, right? Let me read off this list to you. HBAR, Optimism, TIA, SUI, ARB, INJ, SEI, Phil, Lido, Stax, Rose, Mina, SSV, Soul, Blur, Near, Beam. Let's hear this week's watch list. ETH, OP, SUI, ARB, INJ, SEI, Blur, Phil, ETC, Lido, Stax, SSV, Mina, TIA, Soul, HBAR, Aptos, Near, Rose. Pretty similar, right? Pretty similar. But 70% of the coins are exactly the same. So if I come in <laughs> to Friday All Coins watch list this week and give all my summaries and I'm just replying to the same message from last week and saying, hey, just continuation from last week, right? Go click last week's thoughts, read those and apply it to today. Know that I'm doing myself a, a favor and I'm hopefully doing you a favor as well by showing you it's the same thought process. We just, uh, we just get to continue applying it for as long as it works. Eventually, it's going to stop working. Hopefully, you're able to adapt and not live, shout out to Harry, life cycle of a turkey by the time that that happens, right? So I'm going to try and make the workload easier on myself because uh, truthfully, I hate sitting here writing about 20 different coins and paragraphs and sentences about every single one of those 20. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but Yeah. <clears throat> All right, guys, thank you so much. Uh, I do appreciate you guys more than you will ever know. Uh, I appreciate you guys for being the greatest community that I could ever possibly imagine and uh, all that you do for each other and, and what you do for me. So appreciate you. Thank you so much, family. I hope you have a great weekend. I will talk to you again on Monday. Peace, everyone.